Hi, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you for having me today to, to talk about accessibility and inclusion and the potential of digital projects for heritage education. My name is Inesh Kamara and uh, I am the founder of Mapa das Ideias that focuses on the potential relation between cultural heritage, audiences and citizenship since 1999. Uh, I created a company with my business partner, Anna. We're still working together uh, almost 22 years later, and we're very proud about the work that we've been doing. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about digital projects for heritage. And as I said, the specific dimensions of accessibility and inclusion. And um, I wanted to, to underline that I'm not going to be very, well, I didn't want to use the word technical, but at least I'm not going to be very detailed in all the measures or the tools that can be implemented when you're thinking about an accessibility and inclusion uh, project for a museum. I'm more interested in this case about the big picture on how we can learn from each other. And I wanted to share with you some concepts that are very, very closely linked with the potential of the digital means. I'm talking about bubbles and I'm also talking about tiles. And I'm saying what I want to defend is that museums can be places of togetherness, even when we're talking about a digital reality. So today we're going to talk about the, our relation with our audiences and for that we have to go back to basics we're going to talk about a little bit about museums knowledge education but also the idea of public space and how we have to do an important uh, process it's about reaching out but it's also about reaching in we have to talk inside if we want to go outside we have to be aligned as a team we have to share the same values and we have to have uh, a shared vi vision that will give us resilience when things go tough because people um, are contradictory as you know beings and any project has risks and of course we will all make mistakes when we're doing any kind of project so we're going to discuss why the digital digital can represent a new opportunity for inclusion and accessibility in museums. And then I'm going to talk about the tile and chasing the tile and how this is an opportunity for us to grab or to reach out to lost communities. But then I want also to talk about the digital divide and how I feel, and I really want also to stress the word, I feel that empathy will be a very important uh, way or is a very important part of um, developing or strategizing about the museum's digital e existence. So the first thing I want to discuss with you um, is that when we are trained into organizations or in our adult lives, at least, we are trained to define people by their jobs and what they do. So we tend to put people in these small boxes where we uh, give them a certain profile and we tend to link uh, that person to that job and we put um, and we create boundaries to what they can do. And then we're really, it's about boundaries. It's the way we perceive them and also many times the way we also self-represent. And uh, the thing is that the danger of having uh, been trained to do or to think like that is that we tend to blur segmentation with stereotypes and that's a very very complicated process as we also tend to um, use numbers to give us uh, what I think is a very uh, false sense of security because we tend to segment people and we don't we have to realize that each time that we create a segmentation scheme we are creating an artificial division of people. And we have to really be very careful about the way that we do this because people can be uh, put in different boxes, giving different lenses to, to how to 
to see them. And given many times our ignorance about certain themes or the way that we collect our own data, we really tend sometimes to segment our audiences based on our stereotypes and we can't see beyond that. And that leads to think that um, Annalisa Tota um, has defined as a very antagonistic message because we sometimes we think that we are creating or designing an activity or a project for a certain kind of audience and we're viewing or we are drawing that person according to those stereotypes I was talking about or the way that we organize the numbers and that what really happens who actually comes to our uh, activity is not that person and uh, we are in fact reinforcing barriers and social exclusion if we don't invest the time that is needed to collect the data and to overcome our own uh, stereotypes. Many times, or yeah, many times, one of our main um, pre-assumptions is that we tend to see our museum or our, our institution as um, centric to the, other to the other people's interests. And of course, that is uh, far from reality. And it's a good thing that it's far from reality. It's a good thing that we really try to reach out to people that would see us as uh, a part of their life, but are not uh, always or are not uh, driven or don't organize their existence to, around our institution. So many times we tend to see ourselves like uh, the image in the in the right. So we we. We have these rooms full of people and we think that we are listening to our audiences, but in fact, the others see us like the other image. And um, it, this is in fact something that we really have to address and we have to, to embrace as a problem and as part of our uh, work to overcome these long hallways of distance. I organized some case studies just to help us to pinpoint some interesting uh, dimensions. And I really want to, to share with you these case studies because I think that they are um, achievable or attainable projects if we want to do. And again, I'm going to talk about that again uh, later on, but it's all about the vision. It's about what we want to do and how we use are uh, most of the time very, very scarce resources. And that was one of the things that I really wanted to underline when we were talking about um, accessibility and inclusion in museums. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was this project that is developed in Portugal by the Carlos Kubinkin Foundation. Um, and this initiative specifically is a part of an European project called Adest Plus that's co-financed by Creative Europe. We are in fact partners in this project, Mapa das Ideias and the Carlos Kubinkin Foundation. And we are working with other uh, 13 partners in seven European countries. And it's been a wonderful journey about this idea of actively listening to your audiences and also promoting internal change. So in this case, what happened is that um, Gulbenkian dev developed this uh, audience development, sorry for the repeat, repetition, uh, prototype. It's called Gulbenkian 1525 Imagine. And it's about this idea of a collective imagination that comes from a specific target. We're going to talk about that. And I want to stress what would be the five learning points of this case study. It's about learning about your audiences, working with them, so that's one of the things that this, pro this case study proposes. The other one is work cross-sectorial inside your organization and for that develop internal empathy because sometimes we are having or we are developing a certain kind of tension or misunderstandings with our colleagues because we are viewing or we have different priorities within our organization and that's fine. That has to do with what we do for a job, it has to do about the way we are trained 
And um, usually everybody's right. Everybody is in the right space or in the right place in this case to, to defend what they do. And what we have to do is to develop internal empathy, to work together, take risks. Don't be afraid to commit some mistakes. That's a part of developing new ideas. And the trick may be not to take the big risks, not always to do the big project, but try to do micro changes, micro projects, and create a project that is based not only or not mostly on the outputs, but mainly on the process, because that's what people want to be. People want to be in relation. So in this case, uh, in Imagina, and um, we are talking about projects, and th this one is a hybrid project because it started, as I was telling you, it's part of the prototypes that are developed in the Adesh Plus project. And the challenge was to find or to create a project um, that would reach uh, a less uh, involved audience. And um, the Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation really wanted, or they found during the Adesh Plus methodology process that um, they needed to reach out to younger people. So they developed this idea, very interesting idea of working with uh, young volunteers that would go also through the ACE methodology, the audience-centered experience design in a certain sense. They would have uh, activities that would also um, try to underline that kind of methodology. And they would also be involved in the different departments of the Carlos Kobingen Foundation. And they would make, or they would create and propose an event for other young people that would be launched in um, May in the International Day of Museums. So this was the basic idea of the project. The Fundação, the Kobingen Foundation, they launched an open call and we had a group that started to meet of 21 young people. Uh, and as I said, the result of the process, what we wanted to achieve was the creation of a cultural program based on their vision. So it was about what they wanted to learn. And it was very interesting because we started to develop weekly me meetings um, and the foundation staff found themselves in this uh, dual function of being the listeners and learning from them, but at the same time, being the voices of the foundation and sharing this wonderful legacy that um, the foundation represents. So they started to work. And what happened was we had a COVID-19 pandemic in March and everything changed overnight. And what happened also was that the group stayed put. So they changed from uh, living in the foundation in a certain sense of being inside, on-site, sorry, volunteers to being an online group and to talk about, and everybody was together to discuss um, what they were feeling in this very, very strange and difficult moment. And they wanted to do what they proposed to do was, well, let's change what we're going to do and let's create a cycle of debates. And uh, the title would be Imagine Thinking About the Future Today. And they had several moments. So I'm going just to read them in English because the posters are in Portuguese. The spaces um, determine the bodies that inhabit them or bodies determine the spaces in which they live invisibilities, streets and the digital as spaces of um, democratic life in a certain sense. And if art is an act of resistance, what does it resist against? I'm sorry for the bad translation, but um, I think you get the gist. So 
they did all the process. And then what was interesting is what at a certain point in June and July of 2020, they were also involved in a process of reflection about what they had lived. So you really recognize and you really empower the people that you're working with, the people that would be traditional seen, traditionally seen as young audiences to be a part of the process. And you want them to bring all their competencies in. You can learn more about this project. We have a video, you can see it on the Fundação, on Funda, the foundation's website. And it's a 10 minute video and you can see the testimonials and you can just really catch the energy that they had. And I think it was a very important project, not only from the organizational learning point, of course, but for them to be empowered as an audience. And of course, as a, a very uh, surprising uh, support group during the pandemics. So this teaches us that maybe if we go against that idea of just putting people into boxes or resorting to numbers, we can learn from our friends. We can see that what we are as a institution, museums are spaces of social cohesion. And as such, we have to learn more about people because that's the baseline of our days. And then we suddenly find more information and people are not just a, a visitor card holder or a young person or a migrant or a disabled person. They go beyond that because people, well, luckily have very, very different dimensions and that's very, very enticing. That's why we have art and culture and all these things in our lives also. So when we start to define people by what they love, we really start to find places where we as a museum can connect with people. And I really wanted to be a little bit provocative. So I chose um, all these be loving things. One of the things that I love to do and to take uh, full advantage from our digital means is to be part of Facebook groups that have specific themes about which I know nothing about. And one of my groups not this one, but another one that I recently joined in Portuguese was about beekeeping because I was really curious about uh, these urban uh, groups that are really going into the pollinization insects. I wanted to learn more about them. And if you go into these groups, you really, it's an eth ethnographical experience because you really learn a lot about the people. So what happens is that when we define people by what they love, we find or we create a common ground. And it really opens what we can do with our audiences. And it, in a certain sense, gives more density and more diversity to what we offer them. So this is a very important part because we were talking first about the case study of the Fundação, of the Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation, sorry. And I wanted to stress this idea that it's not about the size, it's not about being a powerful, uh, well-bodied institution. It's mainly about the vision. It's about the way that we see ourselves and we see the world around us and we manage our scarce resources. So I wanted to talk first about this project. This project was, evolved, it was developed sorry, by the Instable modern museum in Turkey, and it's called The Color I Touch. I think the, the name is a beautiful name. It's a free program for blind and partially sighted children and young people, and it's done in partnership. So the four main dimensions that I want to pinpoint about this case study is that you have to discover more about your audiences going beyond the disability. And here I'm talking about disability in a very, very wide sense take advantage of multimedia and different techniques. Again, take risks and again, base it on the process, not on the outputs, live the process. Because sometimes what happens also is that we're not living the full potential of our daily lives. And there's such, um, well, there's a promise of beauty and empathy in that. If you really in the moment, 
with the people that come into your house and want to know more about your work. So in this case, the color I touch, it was organized for blind and partially sighted children and young people, as I was saying. And it, what I thought that it was amazing was the level of um, contact and the diversity of techniques that were involved in building this relationship with these groups of people. So they would go uh, through an exhibition tour, but then they would also have art workshops and audio described film screenings. So they never um, let the barrier of working with blind or partially sighted children and young people to stop them to offer a very wide um, framework and they did about they visited the museum so it was about the collections and the objects that's a very important part of our work of course because that's our dna but then they would work the ideas and the knowledge through very different means from arts to drama and then to uh, watching literally uh, film screenings where they would discuss their opinions and their ideas about that. Then going to a different uh, continent, I wanted to talk with uh, about uh, this project that's called Hands on the Wall. And one of the things that I thought that was very captivating about this project was um, the fact that it's about public art and it's about a partnership again. So here, the six main uh, learning points would be recognize, look around you and recognize and use the expertise of others. And of course, that implies that we're working in a partnership and a partnership is by definition, a very horizontal relationship, it's a peer based dynamics. And uh, if the museum comes in with all its knowledge and all its power, we also have to recognize that our partners also have this huge capital of knowledge and experience and we will learn from them even then when they are a very small outlet and we're talking about a massive organization such as ours and and of course it even gets more important if we're talking a very about this very small museum where we are always lacking resources and stuff but what i want to reinforce here is the idea that it's about uh, working together and taking full advantage of what we can offer, uh, albeit the size that we have. So it's about working in partnership. It's about trusting the other. It's about trusting their expertise, their knowledge, and accepting that they know more about that specific theme than we do. And it's about, sorry, there's a typo here, but it's about involving actively the community through, for example, tour visits. And again, it's about taking risks. Please make mistakes. It's a good sign. It's always a good sign because it's a sign that we are evolving and learning. And in this case, go outside of the museum, even when you're working with these more complex um, audiences. Go into the street, go into the garden, go outside the walls and bring your museum with you when you do that. So, in the hands on the wall, I, as I was saying, it's a partnership between the Mucho Association for Inclusive Culture and the Museum of Visual Arts in Santiago, Chile. And what they wanted to address was a chance, they wanted to give um, blind or partially um, uh, visually impaired people the chance of experiencing large, scales, large scale works of art. And they developed this project and they went and they interpreted it in one of the main uh, or more touristy neighborhoods. So you can see here the different um, kinds of means that they use to interpret the, um, the arts of work. The arts of work were chosen in partnership, not only with the association, but also with blind and visually impaired people. They were also worried about accessibility in a broader sense, because once you're in the street, you have a lot, as you know, of physical barriers. So they chose those uh, uh, works of art that could be fully 
enjoyed. And they really, they also know that it's not the perfect um, experience. They also learned about the experience or what they could improve in the project after it was implemented. But I think that's also a very honest account. Like we're not going to be like the total or the best. We're going to do the best we can and we're going to learn about the experience. And maybe in a reasonable period of time or with other resources or other partners, we will still develop the project. We have to take time as an important part of our work. And sometimes we're just in a sprint um, kind of atmosphere. One of the things that I thought that was very interesting was that they involved their specific audience and to be tour guides. They invited people to give their own account of the experience. And I think that's a very interesting thing. Changing completely the, the perspective. Now we are in France and I wanted to talk about the website because we have to talk about the user journey and I'm going to talk about that. And we have to think about all the touch points that we have with um, our audiences. And in this case, the website from the French uh, Natural History Museum is very interesting because I think it's a very um, clear and transparent website. It is not, it recognizes its limits. It doesn't try to go beyond, it's what it is but it contributes for autonomy and empowerment of their audiences. And it gives resources that are very important for an autonomous decision-making process because it's not about making decisions for the people. It's about giving people the resources to make the best decisions for them, given their interests, given their agenda, everything. So I wanted to share, show you the website and to invite you to look into your own website. So it's not only about projects and activities, is about what message you're sending, what content are you giving to people, and how you're letting them plan their own visit. And for that, I would uh, challenge you to go to the internet. There are dozens and dozens. I, I really hesitated in choosing one, so I just chose this one. But this is a typical uh, grid for the customer journey experience. And if you do this exercise internally, you probably find that people are collecting information and making decisions about your museum in ways that you never thought about. And sometimes it's very, very simple, very, very easy to improve the experience. So now we're talking about the team. And again, we just jumped from France to the Netherlands and the Hishks Museum. And again, I want to stress, it's not about the size, it's about the vision. And one of the things I really found inspiring in uh, this case study was uh, the recruitment, the online recruitment of the Hirsch Museum. And this uh, led me to pinpoint five dimensions. We have to have, remember I'm talking all over again, every time about the vision. So we have to have clear values. We have to have very, um, transparent, a very coherent uh, narrative about why we do what we do and how we do it. And that should be shared with all the employees. That implies that we should always invest on capacity building for all staff members, but also service providers. And that's a very important point because uh, we know that many museums are resorting more and more to service providers instead of internal staff members. And we tend to forget them when you're thinking about capacity building or even team building, and they are part of the team. Sometimes they're there for years and years and they feel the museum as theirs also. So we really have to recognize that, embrace that even. And then we have to share the vision with um, all our stakeholders, really letting them know what we represent to, towards what we're working. And that's important, why? Because that will help us when we make mistakes that will give us the power to take risks. And of course, listen to your users. Try to learn about everybody that's involved with your um, organization. So we're talking about this 
beautiful museum. And here I wanted to show to you some quotes about what they say public, publicly in their online recruitment um, page. And they say a lot of stuff. They talk about the importance of people. And then in a certain point they say, in addition, we work to highlight issues around slavery in the colonial past. We offer accessible programming for visits, visitors with impairments, such as sensory friendly evenings. And we seek partnerships to reach underrepresented audiences. Maintaining a colorful and diverse workforce is also important to us. And our specially appointed inclusive, inclusivity, sorry, manager makes sure that we do. And so they really are very clear, not only about their vision, about this idea of being a colorful, colorful and diverse institution, but they also address in a very direct way the means by which they want to do this kind of work, how they want to implement it. And they address they even um, name a person, a job role that addresses this issue. So I'm always talking, oh, well, I've talked a little bit about the online tools, uh, but you may be wondering, like, this is about the digital projects for heritage, and she's going on and on about very physical uh, projects. But that's one of the reasons, because I think that we should not separate the two realms, and we should think about things as a continuum. Um, and more and more, because the fact is that everybody that's under 40 at this point, more or less, are digital natives. And uh, this difference between the physical world and the analogical world sometimes is a quite um, artificial. And I, no pun intended. So after these five states, case studies and before going on for the next part of our lesson, I wanted to challenge you for a call to action. I wanted to tell you like, take time, organize it with your staff and invest in internal meetings, invest in internal learning moments. And it doesn't have to resort always to hiring external um, experts, such as Mapa de Zidaish, my company, or NGOs such as Assess Cultura or other. Sometimes it has to do about using the tools that are developed and that are out there and creating safe spaces to, to, to learn from each other. And it is, please think it as a very peer uh, driven way of working with colleagues. We can go and grab interesting tools such as this one that I'm showing to you and it's very, very good. It's a manual that aims to present an integrated vision about um, how to create an accessibility plan and distribute homework, so to say, ask about experiences, develop a call to action that is shared by the, the team. And I, I decided to share with you this one. This checklist is very interesting because it, um, it was developed, as you can see, by Vocalized Sage Text and DCN for the Southeast Museums in the UK. But it's very interesting because you could go for like a 90-minute meeting, just going through the checkpoints and discussing how we can improve the different uh, dimensions that they are addressing here. And as you can see, we're going from how we welcome people to accessible parking, and accessible toilets. So all the things that are part of uh, the visitor's experience, sometimes that are quite collateral to our uh, main activity, that is telling stories through our collections and objects, but they're all part of how comfortable we want to make, to make the, the experience for our visitors. And then I'm going to show you this one. And this one is a very interesting self-diagnosis tool. It exists in Portuguese and Spanish, not in English, but, um, and this one could be made, you could transform this one in like a self-assessment session where you jointly 
you get together in a room and you answer it online and discuss what they're talking about and see what diagnosis that they give you. And better yet, you share that diagnosis with the Iber Museum program. And they will also learn about your difficulties and they also can develop tools and um, programs for the sector. And this idea of always fostering um, a certain collective intelligence is one of the main um, benefits that working online brings us in a certain sense, because we can really do this kind of sharing and learning um, very easily. So now going to our very, very specific topic about the digital for inclusion. And I wanted to talk with you about the top topic that um, I've, I've been talking about that, this uh, theory from Chris Anderson since he presented it in his book in 2004. He gave also, he's given several uh, wonderful TED talks and conferences about this concept. And when he was talking about, uh, when he presented this theory about the long tail, he was talking about the um, publishing industry for books and music and about the implosion of the traditional gatekeepers. And please uh, take an account that we're not talking about our uh, music streaming services or film streaming services as we know it today. It's 2004 but the concept is already there and what he's talking about is what how we can work um, for the long tail when we don't have the limitation of physical resources and the long tail is a statistically is a statistic concept and uh, for the museums i think this concept is very very interesting and it's very interesting when we're talking about fringe communities and we're talking about inclusion and accessibility, because many times are one of the main barriers that we have to develop niche communities projects is that we don't have the resources or the time to reach everybody. And in this case, what we're doing is we can we are sustaining communities based on what they love. So they are more engaged and more motivated to work with us. And we can also be in a very interesting point that is sometimes more about listening than just uh, about talking. And that's a very important part for our work. So what is the long tail so I can explain it? So when we have, um, when we're working in a physical environment, we have limitations, as I said, we have schedule limitations, we have space limitations, and of course, everything costs money, right? We're talking about the museum exhibition devices, we're talking about security, we're to talking about uh, basic things like water in the toilets and um, how we're going to do the lightning system. So usually what we tend to do is we tend to try to develop exhibitions that even when not, they're not blockbusters, like I was showing, trying to uh, show with this uh, Van Gogh uh, image, we want um, exhibitions and projects that are attended by a lot of people because we're trying to go for uh, a very rational cost benefit uh, ratio. But what if instead of dealing with this and trying to high to reach or to address always the higher demand, we would go for the long tail for these groups where, so here we are, exhibitions with a lot of people that will bring in, we hope, some money and resources and in a short period of time will be heavily attended or we can explore this never ending tale and please see this as a never ending X where we have less people interested in these themes. But if we go online, there will be probably thousands and thousands and thousands of people, even especially if we address the linguistic barriers and we have the exhibition in several languages or the contents or the projects or whatever. And suddenly we have this gigantic community of people all here 
that are interested in our museum and are, com and are building communities around shared interests. For example, electronic music based on folk, folk traditions or the petrogenesis of igneous rocks. And as you can imagine, I really was trying to get the more complex and uh, difficult um, idea just to show you the specificity of this niche that makes perfect sense for geologists all around the world. And imagine your museum as a space where people, professionals can just join up through the online means and talk with each other about this particular interest or see a virtual exhibition or even make the exchange virtually of collections. And this has this huge potential for the museum to develop. So I really wanted you to think about your museum from this point of view, demand versus popularity, and this idea of the small communities with whom we must work. And this takes us to a more ideological in a certain sense or political driven stance. And because we are always, or we tend to, to be afraid of the technologies, but I really think that we should see it as an exciting field for collaborative work. And we should think about that also. We're, we, we, we tend to, to see, for example, artistic work as an exercise of artistic freedom and how it really artists have this incredible role of challenging us, of make us, making us think about difficult subjects or simply, and that's a very important part of course of our lives, just to be in contact with beauty and um, well, nice feelings also. But they have, we're always addressing this idea of the artistic freedom. And I wanted you to also think about that towards cultural heritage, especially when we're using um, historical and artistic contexts, because we can frame it with a scientific approach. And we must uh, give them the knowledge um, because people are, well, that's our role with technologies that are uh, working with the past and with the knowledge. And um, we're offering a full citizenship based on that because we need to know to be empowered. But we're also, or we should also create spaces where we can discuss these representations and we can discuss the monuments freely in democracy. And this should be really a part of the educational and mediation uh, programs. And it's very difficult because usually we're trying to transmit or to be there in context, just giving the narrative or the storytelling. And um, I really think that um, we should do this on site, of course, but when we're talking online, we can even develop more this, um, sorry, this idea of critical discussion and engagement outside the public discourses, because we can allow a personal and a creative appropriation by its users. And sometimes it isn't even relevant in the museum terms. I'm talking about making TikToks with music about uh, my favorite uh, pictures in the museum. And we're talking about a 16 year old that doesn't know anything about art history or about archeology span and yet they offer their vision about what they really find interesting in the museum, or even more so what they don't find interesting and they want to challenge because they don't agree with that, because they see things that we're not seeing. And that's an important part of the idea of using empathy and active listening to learn more about our audiences. And then, of course, to be able to accomplish that, we really must invest again and again in education. And it's not about the conventional approach where we see teachers and students as the recipients of our content. It's more about recognizing that they are our partners in the process and also defending as our dame in distress, the role of scientific research. And it's about also credible information sources. And I think that museums, especially in the digital field have a, well, it's a structural role in that. That's, that's our main thing. We should be always talking about credible information sources because in credible information sources, I'm sorry to be 
repeating this over and over, are essential for the quality of democracy, as we know. And museums have this um, incredible role of being um, able to provide this idea of credible information and also a space for critical discussion. And of course, the idea of uh, enabling other narratives. For that, we really have to invest in capacity building for the teaching staff, but also for the cultural heritage professionals, because this is a different way sometimes of working. It's about the means, but it's not about the Zoom. It's not about using a whiteboard or other online technologies. It's again, always about the vision. It's about what we want to do and how we see our work. And if we start to see our work as mediators, more about uh, creating these public spaces, whilst online, that are about collaboration and about critical discussion, always based on credible information sources. We have this uh, huge uh, wide world waiting for us to, 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 to work upon. But there's also a problem and that's, and I really think, sorry, before going on into that, that movements such as Black Lives Matter, about discussing the gender, gender equality issues, about this idea of the discolonization and recognizing the role of communities. And we're talking about, we tend to put uh, decolonization as a North South uh, perspective but I would really go into our neighboring communities and even with the people that have uh, any kind of disabilities, because we're always doing that. We're always, we tend to have this very strong voice that uh, tends to silence the other voices. And we should really recognize that if we're talking about democracy as a Porto Santo Charter defense, we have to be more democratic as an institution. And um, the Porto Centro de Charter Defense, it was developed by, by the Portuguese National Plan for the Arts in 2021 in a collaborative process with more than um, dozens and dozens of people from organizations, networks, and also other ministries from uh, the European Union. And they talk about the idea of, it's about facilitating collaborative process within the institutions, but also uh, between them and the citizens and about uh, getting people involved in conceptualizing cultural policies. And I really think that's a very, very important stand for us to work upon. But unfortunately, what we also see is that uh, the digital territory also is a space of exclusion with access barriers. And we're again reproducing, if we're talking about in the mid 20th century, about people that couldn't, couldn't read and they didn't have the ability to have certain kinds of professions or do certain kinds of jobs and their own civic participation. At this point, we also have to talk about people that don't have access for very different reasons to the digital space. And we have to address the digital divide because what happened in the pandemics in certain cultural institutions, albeit their size, sometimes they were very big heritage sizes, but they didn't have a digital existence and they, bake, bake, they became, sorry, invisible to their users because they closed and so suddenly they weren't there and they weren't there, their knowledge wasn't there and their communities weren't there. So that's one point of the digital divide is from the cultural institutions, the ones that don't have the capacity to be online and to talk online and how we can help our colleagues for networking, for partnerships, to share the resources, share the knowledge, and uh, create a very diverse um, online heritage uh, landscape. And on the other side, of course, we're talking about our people, the people that come and visit us, the people that could learn more about our collections, the people that would want to talk about them and to work upon them. And some people can't because they don't have internet available, they don't have the means, they don't have their own devices, and uh, how we can keep them involved. And I really wanted to talk about that because 
it can't be reduced to social media and online content strategy, in my opinion. It can't be about who has a louder voice or who can scream louder. It isn't about publishing every day in every form. It has to do about community and capacity building, and it has to be about a dialogue. And this brings me to an important part of this discussion. That is, again, remember that I, 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 at the beginning I was telling you, it's not about the technical aspects of building an accessibility plan. It's about a vision. And it's about also building a relationship with our communities, even when we're talking about digital relations that are based on empathy. And we should do empathy as a central value for our organization, because it is about um, connecting. It's about many times creating a space of togetherness. We have to reinvent our public spaces. And of course, what we want is to be together again, because we know that that's an essential part of our uh, biology. We're social animals and we really need to share the same space. But it's also about this idea of uh, being a public institution, even when you're a private museum, of creating public spaces where people feel emotional connected and feel that other people are actively listening and are actively addressing your concerns. And I think that this is a very easy uh, place for people in museums to be within because um, our, our job is about curiosity. And um, if you're a curious person, you probably are a good listener. And when we think about the online um, universe or ecosystem as a place of listening, and not only of screaming or badgering, it reveals or it has this promise of many, many projects and experiences, especially when you decide that you can take risks and that you have friends out there. You have people that share the same interests, even though it can be only like two people in your neighborhood in the immediate vicinity of the museum, but they can be like thousands all over the world, the country, wherever. So I really think that um, we have a lot of work to do, but I hope that you enjoyed our lesson. We can check the references um, that I share with you here. You can see the movies. And thank you so much for bearing with me this um, explanation. And I hope that you will also uh, enjoy my colleagues' uh, lessons and see you soon. Thank you very much.